Alfred Bourgeois was convicted for torturing and beating his two-year-old daughter to death. An execution date was stayed by a federal judge due to evidence from Bourgeois' legal team showing that he had an intellectual disability. This ruling was overturned in October 2020. Lisa Montgomery strangled a pregnant woman in Missouri before cutting out and kidnapping the baby in 2004. Her lawyers said she experienced brain damage from beatings as a child and suffers from serious mental illness. She was the first woman to face federal execution in the US since 1953. Corey Johnson was convicted for the murder of seven people related to his involvement with the drug trade in Richmond, Virginia. Johnson's legal team argued that he suffered from an intellectual disability related to physical and emotional abuse he experienced as a child. Dustin John Higgs was convicted in the 1996 kidnapping and murder of three young women in the Washington, D.C. area. Higgs did not kill any of his victims. His co-defendant, Willis Haynes, did after being instructed to by Higgs. Haynes has said in court documents that Higgs did not threaten him or force him to shoot. These people, as well as having committed heinous crimes, are also the victims of a last-ditch attempt on the part of Donald Trump to imprint himself on US political history by carrying out a killing spree in absolute and disgustingly vindictive defiance of 130 years of federal restraint. This is an egregiously wrathful abuse of federal power and it baffles me that it's not being talked about more. I am fundamentally opposed to the death penalty. It's the only thing I can think of that if the UK were to reverse its policy on, I would be forced to leave the country. I can't sleep at night with the idea of being a citizen of a nation that would allow that. Of course, for a lot of Americans, it's something that they're well accustomed to. It barely passes controversy and I have no interest in condemning them for that. The truth is that if I were raised as those people were raised, I would import those values too. So for that reason, I'm not going to do the human rights equivalent of some kind of vegan propaganda horror show. I'm not gonna show you graphic images or tell specific tales of justice miscarried, because while those things might bother you for a while, they bother anybody, I don't think they would be very persuasive in the long term. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a, an, an overview of my rebuttal to the arguments for capital punishment. What is the law for? Well, should the law be primarily concerned with being a vehicle for your revenge? Should it be primarily concerned with obsessively matching punishment to crime? The moral transgression of a crime is often very hard to detect, and that's why we have different categories of offence, even within categories. Western democratic law thankfully does not preoccupy itself with absolutes. It preoccupies itself with grey areas so that it can do what we need it to do, which is to serve society with increasing accuracy and increasing attendance to the noblest ideals that we can conjure. So, presumably, if you're in favour of capital punishment, you believe that some people deserve to die. Well, guess what? You have a point. Presumably also, if you have such a decisive vision of justice, you must also recognize that the execution of a person not guilty of the convicted crime is a thing that is beyond tolerance. You must surely agree that there can be absolutely no margin for error where the application of the death penalty is concerned. But the problem is that you are talking about a system that is now, and for the foreseeable future, incorrectably prone to malfunction. Do you really think that there's an acceptable margin of error when you're talking about such a grave potential injustice? The killing of an innocent person by the state, but yet you can't have the package without a margin of error because errors are part of administrative structures. That's why we have so much apparatus designed around damage control from the level of the individual to the nation and, and beyond. And presuming that there's a big overlap between the eye for an eye perspective and the libertarian perspective, are you sure you want to hand your government that much reach? What if the punishment remains an option, but the law changes emphasis? Treason is still punishable by death. Would you be content to see someone as hapless as the I got maced girl killed by the state? No, of course not, you say. The punishment should fit the crime. That's what this is all about. But if the state retains the ability to exercise the death penalty 
And yet, on the other hand, you have very limited access to legislation. How can you be sure under which laws such a punishment would be administered? Laws can change quickly. For example, in a global pandemic type situation. Looking at the crimes outlined in the beginning of this video, you might say, well, I'd soon change my mind about this if a friend or a loved one were a victim. How would I feel if I were to lose a loved one in such a way? Well, <clears throat> I would want to kill them. I would want to find them and, and, and kill them. But guess what? That's why I'm not in charge. I'd be grief-stricken, out of my wits. I'd be beyond reason, which is the thing the law should always err towards. And we all believe that the law should aim to be reasonable. Depending on where we place the, the summit of reason, our goalposts will vary from individual to individual. But no one has ever said, I would like the law to be less reasonable. We tacitly understand that it is a thing that should move in an enlightened direction. Now, in your very best estimate, in your very best estimate, would you say that the killing of prisoners is a thing that is towards reasonability? If, since the crime took place, we've had a chance to reflect, look at the big picture, and be more procedural about things, and yet we still affirm the death penalty, then that action begins to look more like killing as an outcome of bureaucracy. It begins to look more like killing in cold blood. There's a difference between brutality and cruelty. I think that we reserve a special disdain for cruelty because by definition it is without feeling. It's the difference between a soldier and a torturer. What if you confess to having stolen or broken one of my favourite toys and my response was to punch you in the face? Pretty ugly response, you might say, and disproportionate, unless you understand precisely how much I value my Macquarie Collection Rebel Trooper. It would, to say the least, represent a failure of civility on my part. Now, what if I were to say, OK, I forgive you, but because you have done this to me, I am going to take revenge. I have decided that it will be a proportionate revenge, i.e. I won't punch you in the face, but I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to carry the revenge out, or precisely what the form of the punishment will be. Okay? Now, which response do you think frames me as the more sadistic, the least honourable? Which is crueler, more unusual? Part of the difference between brutality and cruelty is to do with time and consideration. One of the things that makes the delayed execution cruel as well as brutal is that it inflicts the prolonged apprehension of being killed upon the prisoner. Over days, weeks, months, or in these recent federal cases, over decades. If you have truly considered what an awful thing this is to inflict, even on the person who is literally your worst enemy, then it behooves you to consider what it is that you might be becoming if you continue to affirm this kind of punishment. Are you stopping evil? Well, good luck with that. We can't stop evil. We can damage control. We can contain. Are you containing evil? Or are you letting it bleed into and permeate your life? If you're a God-fearing person, you might want to think about how that God currently feels about you. I suppose it comes down to which kind of world you'd like to live in. A world where murder is wrong, or a world where murder is what we do to murderers. But make no mistake, though there may be an overlap between those positions, they do not represent the same ideals. Which do you find it easier to live with? a brutal species or a cruel society.